Discussion to Truth, early edition, we had the 1 o'clock hour, J.P. Lindstroth, the Lindstroth Report. Joining us uh, at this hour from Dublin, Ireland, John Waters. Uh, that'll be coming up here in about 10 minutes. Again, Discussion to Truth every Wednesday, 5 o'clock Eastern, typically. And at that 5 o'clock slot today, we'll have... Dear Maid McCulloch, it's a lecturer at Oxford Theologian. He'll be discussing his views of church, state, acceptance or unacceptance of homosexuality, amongst other things. Uh, again, that's coming up at our normal 5 o'clock hour slate next month, June 3rd. Pharma, Greed, Lies, and the Poisoning of America. Gerald Posner, a merciless pit bull of an investigator, according to the Chicago Tribune. Look, Posner is an investigative journalist, author, and former Wall Street attorney. He's a native of San Francisco, resides in Florida, at least part-time, was Phi Beta Kappa and summa cum laude, University California Berkeley. While there, he was a national debating champion. The Meikle John Award recipient. Posner went on to receive a JD from Hastings at the same school. Um, and uh, he regularly appears on NBC, History Channel, CNN, Fox News, CBS, MSNBC. He's a bar member of New York and DC. That's coming your way June 3rd next month, later this month, backed by Thinker and Dwell, Jupiter, Florida-based investor and owner of Babylon B. Seth Dillon will be joining the program, and that will be at the 6 o'clock hour, the 5 o'clock hour on May 27th, will be Project Veritas founder... James Edward O'Keefe, the third, earned a BA in philosophy from Rutgers University. Very controversial what he's doing, and he authored American Bravda, My Fight for Truth in the Era of Fake News. Quote, or, uh, folks, why is fake news an issue? Okay, if you're an American, why is there fake news? Why has that become a reality of the way that you receive information. Isn't that a cornerstone of the Constitution? Freedom of press? So where does fake news come into play there? <clears throat> and why, pardon me, why do you allow fake news to continue to be transmitted through your radio, your podcasts, Typically not podcasts, but more mainstream radio and television. That's what we do here at Discussion of Truth is we aim to seek out and destroy, hence the opening song, corruption on various levels. And uh, like JP and I spoke about at the 1 o'clock hour, uh, why... Why is it in uh, perhaps the most developed, that's argument, one of the most developed countries on the planet, a first world country, why is it that there is no decent health care system for all? Neighbor to the North's got one. UK's got one. It's a bit archaic, isn't it? 
in thinking and policy. Den Bishop, who is the president of Holmes, Murphy, and Associates, will be joining us next week. He's the author of Health Care Reform. We'll be talking about that. Uh, so coming up here in a few moments, John Waters will join us from Dublin, Irish writer and formerly a newspaper columnist. He was born in Ireland, West Ireland, doesn't matter. He grew up in the town of Castellaria. And uh, his first book, Crossroads, 1991, about the cultural underbelly of Irish politics, became a massive bestseller. And it was reissued by Transworld in 2012. Waters is currently fighting Ireland's high court for what he believes are inalienable human rights and what he believes are unconstitutional mandates from the state in wake of the COVID-19 pandemic, i.e. stay-at-home orders. Apart from Transworld, his previous publications include Race of Angels, a study of roots of U2's music in Irish history and culture. He has written two books about the religious and spiritual imagination of modern Ireland, entitled Lapsed, Agnostic, and Beyond Consolation, on how we, be, how we became too clever for God and our own good. He is currently completing a third book in the series, provisionally entitled Men Without Chests. His book, Give Us Back the Bad Roads, will be published October 2018. So I took that off of website, and of course that is out of date, as that book apparently has been published. Uh, but let's look at the midsection there of what I reported to you and read to you. Uh, and by the way, I'm, I'm not a journalist and I'm not a reporter. I am simply a American citizen uh, who started this program going on four years, three and a half years ago. And I did it in the wake of the Zika epidemic in Miami. And the controversial pesticide, if you type into your web browser, Zika, Z-I-K-A, Ian Trottier, I-A-N-T-R-O-T-T-I-E-R, and uh, that, should, that should yield a result there on the article that is still up at Honey Colony as to why I do what I do. And it was by invitation, invitations, just as the book that's coming out here shortly was by invitation, well, suggestion to write. Um, publish, publishing, the publisher is Trine Day, and that's coming out. Push back because of the COVID-19 items and issues. Push back to a late July release. Uh, was scheduled here for April, but uh, that's been pushed back. Last week, Doki Fasian, she's an international human rights expert and part of the staff for Reporters Without Borders, for press freedom. That's uh, she, what she does uh, based out of France, but she's in New York, I believe, or at least uh, D.C. Uh, that's what her and her group do is fight for freedom of press globally. Uh, she joined us last week, and uh, that uh, uh, was, a, was the follow-up hour to the initial uh, guest of Avi Jorish. He's an entrepreneur and Middle East expert. He's a senior fellow at the American Foreign Policy Council and uh, founder of IMS, a merchant processing company that services clients nationwide. Just a phenomenal discussion we had with Avi last week. Uh, his work has been published by New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Foreign Affairs, Forbes, and others. Um, and uh, his current book, Thou Shalt Innovate, How Israeli Ingenuity is Repairing the World. Paraphrase. Um, so we had a great discussion about um, what's going on in Jerusalem and Tel Aviv and basically how they've set up their culture to spawn creativity and set up their next generations for accepting failure to lead to success, if you will. Um, the week before that, we hosted Robert Spalding. He's a um, U.S. Air Force Brigadier General and uh, pilot of the uh, Stealth Bombers. He discussed briefly his book, Stealth War, how China took over while America's elite slept. So uh, just a phenomenal uh, discussion we had with him and gearing up here in a few minutes to receive John Waters onto the program. I want to briefly 
uh, very briefly run by you. It's not, if you go to my website, iantrache.com, what I do there is I compile articles, um, publications, all available, no cost to you, uh, simply because I get my findings out there. Um, and, um, and, and that's really the nexus of why I do what I do is to educate those who listen to me and read on me. And, um, uh, it is, again, I believe in an inalienable right. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so anyway, what you will find when you go to iantrotier.com, I-N-T-R-O-T-T-I-E-R.com, click on the articles tab. And you'll find work by, for instance, Anthony Sutton, uh, amongst many others. Uh, he was a former Stanford Hoover fellow and began really reporting on what would be considered as the deep state. And the deep state are basically the financial reins and strings that puppet the U.S. government. Yes, this is actually happening. Yes, it is would be accurate to say that they do not support the U.S. Constitution because it is an international banking conglomerate, and uh, and that would be basically my interpretation of what the deep state is. Uh, but here, here, so this is what's interesting here. I'm speaking English, and it's not native to what we know as North America. It's not native to any part of either one of these continents. English, of course, is from England, where most of the founders of this country that we know today of the United States uh, hailed from, if you will. Um, and it's certainly what the Constitution is written in. There was an independence uh, gained uh, against England, isn't it? 19, uh, or excuse me, 1776, July 4th. Isn't that why Americans celebrate the, the Independence Day? It was, a, it was a liberty against the British monarchy and military. Uh, however, what's interesting is George Washington. Now, were there, there were other presidents, uh, uh, continental presidents before him, but he is the first officially recognized president of the country known as the United States of America, or rather the Corporation of the United States of America, right? So what's interesting here is he owned shares during the American Revolution of the Bank of England. This is supported by research out of a Harvard professor. Yes, I will repeat because it's important to listen, to re-listen if you didn't catch it first time. George Washington is known to have owned shares in the Bank of England during the American Revolution. So you might step back and say, wait a second, why would he be owning shares of a bank of an enemy's bank or institution? Well, because the Bank of England doesn't represent the people of England, it doesn't represent the, the military, it represents the people that control the military, which those peoples are not. British, they're sovereign, they, they, they occupy land known as Britain, but they are sovereign to that country. This, known as the Corporation of London, a Roman mechanism per Ronan Palin, former guest on the program about a month ago, out of London, an economist. Okay, so very interesting to, uh, to, to, uh, to look at, <clears throat> pardon the static, and... Um, but I will further, before we be drawn, drawn on, because I know he's waiting in the wings here, further I want to read to you, and I'll soon have this up on, on my website, iantrotier.com, Congressional Record Proceedings and Debates of the 76th Congress, Third Session. This is not live yet, but it will soon be live. Remarks by Representative Thorkelson, and he quotes, again, this is in 1940, he quotes... And if you think these things are not pertinent to you today during the COVID-19 pandemic, you would be wrong. He quotes Andrew Carnegie, and this is a quote out of Triumphant Democracy, Carnegie's book. The quote is, let men say what they will. I say that as surely as the sun in the heavens once shone upon Britain and America united, so surely is it one morning to rise, to shine upon, to greet again the reunited states. I'm not saying the reunification. The reunited states. 
the British American Union. Is that quote odd to you? I hope it is. Because that should lead you to investigate and research and act. And perhaps, yes, to question the existence of the Federal Reserve Bank of the United States, which is not federal and does not represent the Constitution. From everything I know, I'm not a legal analyst, I'm not a legal voice, simply a U.S. citizen doing research, but the Federal Reserve is not federal, it's a private central bank. Thread the needle. Okay, uh, bringing on John Waters right now. You've tuned in to Discussion to Truth, and I am host... Ian Hamilton Trottier. Bring him on via Skype. Share the episode with family, friends. Okay, uh, he's not. He's not online. Um, hold on a second. Let's see, let's try him back. Just spoke to him yesterday, so he I know he's waiting for it. He's expecting this. Ringing in John Waters again. Okay. Uh, he's not online. We're trying to Skype him in. And let me briefly... Shoot him a quick message, as we did connect uh, yesterday. So... He should be expecting me. Okay. Wait for his reply. Again, John Waters is currently... Um, he's currently battling the high court in London. Because his... And, and so this is this was an interesting... This is an interesting take, right? Because uh, we had a special Lindstrap report today at, at the 1 o'clock hour. You can catch that on... Um, Apple Podcasts, you can catch that at anchor.fm, catch that on Spotify. Um, again, just like uh, all uh, of my previous ep episodes, uh, they are all available um, online. Okay. Um, let's see here. Let me get, get my, recollect my, my train of thought here. Um, and, 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 See if I can shoot John an email in case he's uh, he's on his email, and then I will get back into um, I will get back into discussing uh, one second here. Thanks for your patience. Um, so with JP, now JP's got a PhD from Oxford. He, um, teaches at a couple different institutions in South Florida, one of them being Barry University. Yes, this happens to be the same school that Shaquille O'Neal earned a doctorate from. JP did not study. At the school, he instructs at the school. Um, he did, again, to repeat, receive his PhD from Oxford. He's also a Fulbright scholar to Brazil. Um, and JP's angle was, I think, a common angle. Uh, in order to fully reopen the economy, we've got to have mass testing. One can be carrying the COVID-19 virus, not even know it. Um, a local store to where I'm at is testing its employees to are taking their temperature. If the temperature is too high, they're not permitted to work that day. The current administration in the White House 
is has now begun to almost ignore the pandemic and refocus on the economy. Now, Robert Kennedy, who I've reached out to, um, an invitation to join the program, I understand, has recently joined the Trump staff. Here's the argument. And again, um, JP saying, hey, look, it's a, it's a virus that's killing people and people should be tested. Okay, hard to argue with that. Very hard. It's hard to argue with that. Again, this is all included in the Lindstroth report that was recorded earlier today, the 1 o'clock hour p.m. Eastern Standard. The opposing view to that, of course, there are, there are many, but the view uh, embraced by John, John Waters, as we're waiting for, for him to become available, which we hope he certainly will become available, um, he and I just corresponded yesterday. It is possible something has come up. It's fine. Um, the view from John, for instance, in Dublin is... Self-isolation should be a voluntary measure, whereas if you feel that your immune system is at risk is, if, of, of contracting the virus, then you should voluntarily restrict your physical involvement in, in, in and with and around, in and with around, interesting sentence, others. So to demand from a government standpoint that you have no choice and are mandated to not leave your house, is a violation, John argues, of constitutional rights. This is this is in Ireland. We're seeing extremes taken in the United States, of course, where we have protests, and we addressed this earlier with JP in Michigan, where folks are showing up to rallies armed with guns, uh, self-defense mechanisms, weapons. Um, that's an extreme. Because nobody wants violence. Who wants violence? Uh, the argument, of course, is, well, violence makes people money, so wars are deliberately created. Hard to argue with that. Uh, so that certain corporations cash in. A disgusting reality. Yes, it's quite possible this is true. Um, so John is fighting in Ireland for what he is calling an inalienable right to be able to leave one's house and interact in community and therefore allow that person to be exposed to various ailments. All right, we're going to try John again. I have not received a response from him, but we will try him again. He's buzzing in John Waters, columnist based out of Dublin, Ireland. Okay, John is not connected. Again, he and I corresponded as recently as yesterday, it is possible that something came up. The second hour here, we have Dermade McCulloch. He's a professor at Oxford University. So we'll try to get John. If we cannot get John, uh, then um, then. We'll, we'll have to reschedule with him. Uh, a la Bandy Lee, Yale professor who has written a book criticizing the state, the mental state, 
of Donald Trump. Um, and we've had her join the program. Unfortunately, we've had to reschedule. So that'll be coming back up. Let me get back into uh, while we wait, John. Hopefully we can get a few minutes with him today. Let me get back into uh, the congressional report, Proceedings and Debates of the 76th Congress, 3rd edition. Uh, st this is just, it's, 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 it's really remarkable. Um, so, so put yourself into, put yourself into the mindset of a couple of different things. Um, but one, let's just, let's just, let's just, let's just go with this narrative of fake news. So why is news, why has news become biased? Okay, because it's profiting certain corporations, and certainly you turn on Fox News, and it's way far right. It's it's just like disgustingly far right. It's like oh my gosh, seriously, like whoa, right? Okay, hopefully that uh, <laughs> that that uh, here we go. Okay, we've got John and ringing John in right now, and I, I uh, try to get back to this congressional report. Here we go, John Waters. <laughs> Dublin, Ireland. Hello? John, discussion to truth, it's hey, Ian Trottier. Sorry, I, 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 I must have miscalculated the time because I thought we were six hours between us, but uh, apparently not. Uh, not a problem. I'm glad I was able to reach you. John, uh, it's a pleasure to have you join the program, and I know what you're doing for human rights in Ireland. And uh, I'm hoping to amplify your cause. Would you please give listeners a brief introduction to you uh, and what you're doing? And then I'd like to get into uh, I'd like to get into it here. Okay. Well, I, I, I was a journalist for many years in Ireland. Uh, uh, I worked for the Irish Times for twenty, uh, nearly twenty five years. Uh, I was a, a columnist with them, and uh, I've written uh, 10 books, mainly about Ireland, about Ireland, Irish history, essays about different aspects of politics and, and uh, culture and uh, spirituality, I suppose, or religion. Uh, I've been, uh, I wish to be a playwright, so I haven't written a play for quite a few years now, purely because I've been immersed in this, I suppose, battle, uh, which I didn't realize I was involved in for many years uh, uh, against certain forces, which become more and more clear to us as we go on. And uh, so I, I have this, uh, I suppose, habit of uh, finding myself uh, while on the one hand wishing to kind of withdraw and, you know, I don't know, sit on the porch and listen to the radio. Uh, life seems to have other plans for me. So now I find myself in the midst of a constitutional battle here in Ireland because of the lockdown. Which I think is, a, you know, definitely, uh, obviously, is a global event that is seems to have a common uh, pattern. Uh, but nevertheless, in Ireland, it seems to have a pattern which relates to a series of events that have been going on here for quite a few years, certainly intensely in the past uh, decade, uh, which really relate to our constitution, our fundamental rights, and the onslaught on them from all kinds of forces, including, you know. Uh, corporatocracy, uh, mainly from America, uh, the European Union, the United Nations, uh, the LGBT uh, global uh, elite uh, who are trying to basically, I think, transform family understandings and family policies in uh, uh, many countries. But uh, Ireland being a small, previously Catholic country seems to be a particular target. And uh, so these battles have sort of are sort of converging in, in this present one, I think, you know, which seems to be a real uh, power grab of the most fundamental rights of citizens and essentially an attempt to overturn the idea that we are all free people uh, uh, who uh, do not take our rights from the state or our freedoms from the state, but are given them from elsewhere, from God in our constitution in Ireland. And uh, uh, that, that's really, I suppose, what brought us here. John, uh, great, well said, and I commend you on your fight. Um, there's obviously uh, we've we've now got a global 
uh, 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 fight in this regard, um, which um, is uh, not isolated to to any one country, but perhaps the isolation uh, can be made through various economic mechanisms. I'm not sure what angle you've gone uh, through in that regard, but let's look at let's look at exactly what you are fighting for in Dublin, and that is the the human right. Uh, if I understand this correctly, and, and, and definitely correct me if you would, if I'm wrong, but you are fighting for, and this is a, this is with the High Court in Ireland, uh, you are fighting for the human right to uh, not be locked down due to uh, the COVID-19 uh, threat. Is that correct? Essentially, yes. Uh, essentially, it, it boils down to that, but I, I, it can be expressed in different ways. It can be expressed, expressed in fundamental freedoms, the right to assemble, the right to walk, uh, to go where one pleases, you know, to not, not to be subject to uh, arbitrary force, uh, arbitrary uh, interrogation by the police, uh, the right to earn a livelihood, the right to religious observ observance, uh, uh, to, to walk into a church. Uh, uh, all these rights have been summarily taken away and, and uh, you know, you're right in the sense that uh, there is an economic dimension to these things because we are now looking down the barrel of a of a serious uh, hurtling towards a, a depression of possibly unprecedented uh, scale, and that will have all kinds of uh, consequences, including economic consequences, uh, which will in eventually end in human consequences in terms of human life, human livelihood, uh, the capacity of people to maintain their homes, uh, all kinds of consequences, which, as we say, will, will result in what in America is known as uh, deaths of despair, which is not a concept we have seemingly, we have uh, arrived at yet, although, of course, we have those consequences in, in, in particular contexts, uh, suicide, uh, self-destruction, uh, uh, alcoholism, drug addiction, uh, and so forth. And uh, the misery that will attend to this uh, will be immense. And there has been no calculus, is part of our point, uh, uh, prepared or presented uh, as an alternative to the alleged attempt to save lives from COVID-19, which increasingly becomes threadbare as one sees that the figures on a global basis are being falsified through uh, uh, spurious uh, certification and that the tests are not reliable for COVID-19. And all of this seems to converge on, on, on one thing, you know, this one word now, which is coming up again and again and again, that word is vaccination, vaccines. That whereas in the beginning we were told that the object was to uh, uh, flatten the curve and then we would have our freedoms back. And then it was something else. It was that when the, the rates of uh, infection reduced and the, the death rates reduced, we would have our freedoms back. All these things have happened and we still have not had freedoms back. And what I find in court is really quite frightening mean, in a way, because what I find is that we face an establishment, an implacable establishment, which I'm sorry to say seems to include the judiciary, which we thought would be the arm of government that was going to rescue us from these things in which they don't seem to be aware of what's happening or indeed to attach any great significance to it. You know, I mean, it's an amazing thing. You know, people put questions to me and I've had questions put to me in the past week from the judge. Well, what what would you do in this situation when, when faced with an epidemic, faced with the kind of uh, projections that the government was faced with, the government of Ireland and the governments of other countries? Uh, and it seems the implication of that question is to say, well, of course, it's justified to lock up people. <laughs> and for a moment, you're, you're following this thread of logic and you're saying, and then it occurs to you, no, no, no. You, there's no question that in any context like this, you can take away fundamental freedoms. That is not an option. Of course, medical options are necessary. Uh, medical initiatives uh, to quarantine infected people potentially vulnerable people, all of this. None of that, by the way, was done in Ireland. We have most of our deaths now are in, in care homes, nursing homes, 60%. And uh, nothing was done to, to fence these off, to cre create a particular uh, set of protections in these. Whereas the healthy people going about their business, law-abiding people, 
were imposed upon in this spurious, untested uh, system of uh, social uh, distancing, uh, which is causing untold psychological and I would say health damage to to many countless people in many countries all over the world. Yeah, you got some great points there, uh, John, and 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 I want to. Just because I, I want to bring into the conversation something I'm not sure if you're aware of, but but going off the uh, going off the vaccine angle to this um, now uh, there's there's the opposition of hey uh, people should be locked down because uh, other people in the grocery store or the postal office or the bank may be carrying this virus and if they're not wearing masks then I might be prone uh, to 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 getting the virus and um, you know I, I, I even though I'm wearing a mask and, and gloves it could still uh, pass on to me so there's there's this whole kind of fear factor. Uh, and, and, and threat of being exposed uh, to carriers that are carrying and, and even even if they've tested uh, negative, they're still carrying it. Right? It just hasn't been developed. So there's all types of different kind of in-depth angles to this. But, but drawing out the vaccine angle, because uh, as an American, uh, we've got Bill Gates here, our, one, of the, one of the wealthiest men, according to Forbes, uh, on the planet and a computer engineer, yet he's inserted himself right into the uh, right into the conversation here of of this uh, of this health pandemic, uh, and he's calling for vaccination. So what I what I want to insert at this point, and this is by my research, John, uh, it, according to the World International Patent Office, uh, Microsoft has filed a patent, and it's been published now. It's been it's been granted uh, to uh, actually. So 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 again, we go off that economic angle. They will own they own a patent to run a cryptocurrency system. Uh, that mines microchipped human beings. So there again, if you insert the vaccine uh, issue, then it seems that there's a push to mandate vaccines on vaccines on some level. Certainly, stateside uh, uh, California has mandatory vaccinations for public schools. I believe New York does as well. What are your thoughts in regard to that angle, John? Well. You know, in some way, in it, it, it all sounds very uh, kind of sci-fi, and 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 uh, you know, in a certain sense, one recoils from even entering into this because it seems so like uh, dystopian and and dark that it cannot bear any relationship to the lives we've lived up to now. You know, and in in, in Ireland, as you can imagine, like we are still in a kind of a a trajectory from a country that was deeply Catholic, deeply nationalistic, mystical, uh, you know, mythological. And yet we are plunged, plunging into this world which is uncharted and it seems unchartable. And and uh, so, uh, and, and, and having said that, you know, I'm well aware that the capacities of, 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 of technology are escalating at such a, a rate of knots that it is almost impossible to control them and indeed to monitor them with any kind of ethical program and there seems to be this complete now mismatch between the scientific capacities that we have and the ethical capacities we have in order to to check and 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 balance these uh, now when you move to somebody like bill gates you get an entirely different kind of feeling about what's going on because you know, the first question that comes into my mind is, well, who is Bill Gates? Well, he makes computers or something. I don't know. Uh, so what? Fine. Make computers, Bill. Get out of my face. Right. Right. But why are you telling me what I need to do for my health? Why are you talking to me at all? I didn't invite you. I didn't elect you. And this is something it seems that I is, I don't think we've really cottoned on to yet, that we have actually already the beginnings of a new, not just aristocracy, but a new royalty who assume power through, by virtue of wealth. And from that position of power begin to dictate the most intimate aspects of our lives to us without any mandate uh, of any kind, without invitation by the, from the public, from the people, purely by virtue of wealth, power of wealth. That you know, each billion is like a vote uh, from somewhere that entitles them to speak and entitles them to intervene and entitles them to impose. This is something radical and new. When you think about it, that uh, I think it is the case now that three men—Warren Buffett, Bill Gates, 
and uh, what's who's the third one? Uh, Jeff Bezos. Between right. them, own as much have as much wealth as the right. rest of America put together. Think about that. That 330 million people on one side have half the wealth of America, and three men on the other side of the line have the other half. Yeah, we're no, we're, looking, yeah. We're Go in ahead, big trouble here, Ian. We were in the most extraordinary trouble here on a global basis because everything that we had in terms of an ethical understanding of reality seems to be slipping at a terrible rate. You know, that there, there seems to be no sense that it is now possible to contain any of this. I've noticed this again in court in the, during the week, you know, from... You know, from certain responses, I don't know if judges are aware of this or are conscious of what they're doing, but the responses you get when you actually draw attention of the judge now to something illegal, the the response is a prevarication, uh, as if to say, well, I, when I talk, I'm talking about illegal, I'm talking about illegality on behalf of the state, I, or, or, or an imposition on behalf of the state on the people. There's always a, a prevarication or an excuse offered as opposed to what one would expect from a judge, which is outrage that the law is being broken and that the constitution is not being upheld and excuses being offered, mitigation being offered, which is not the judge's job uh, if the system is working correctly. So uh, I I am sorry to say that I'm more and more uh, uh, pessimistic uh, that short of a major awakening in the world by the people and a rapid re-education of the people by themselves as to the reality of the, what is happening and what is there to be taken away from them, how it works, how it can be put back together, how they can reclaim it, uh, I think that we will end up in a, in a really serious form of totalitarian despotism before very long. John, in, in Dublin anyway, and uh, I, again, I, uh, I, I, I think the fight that you're, you're fighting is very commendable. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and I happen to agree with you in that, uh, in that a, 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 a mandatory lockdown is uh, is is again, in my view, a violation of an inalienable right. In, in my opinion, John, uh, we are all human beings, and we are all entitled. Unfortunately, our governments and physical boundaries don't allow that all the time. But we are all entitled to share this planet uh, equally. Um, but John, in Dublin, uh, what what is the what have you found to be uh, your largest obstacle. Um, it, it, whereas, if if we go to um, if we go to these wealthy and powerful corporations uh, that are strangling the middle class, if you will, or the average human, uh, because of this uh, this 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 power uh, created by this wealth, what is the challenge? Uh, in Dublin, that you find you're facing in in your battle, are you able? Have you been able to identify? Oh yeah, it's it's external uh, uh, influences and power, uh, you know, being imposed on the government, the duly elected government of Ireland, who are essentially from the moment each member is elected by the people, they simply go off for four to five years and ignore the wishes of, and uh, and the needs of the people completely and serve. Uh, external interests and see them so their role as being to maintain their own careers by basically breaking their own country up for scrap and selling it off to the highest or lowest builder bidder in some instances if it uh, suits their own situation or pocket and uh, so that's our problem it's to do with the 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 the, inf- the extraordinary fact that our country is now in a form of neo-colonialism we had 800 years of colonialism at the hands of our nearest neighbor yeah. uh, Britain uh, now we are back in a different situation with the American uh, transnational sector, which is here in, in 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 Dublin to an extraordinary extent. I mean, and in Ireland generally. I mean, we our history is is a, quite a it's a it's a long story. In but let's say that you know we got our independence uh, almost a, a century ago. 
it was a very poor time for us to get our independence. We were between two world wars. We were left swinging in the world. We didn't have much help from the rest of the world. And as a result, which was preoccupied with other things, naturally enough. And uh, so as a result, we struggled. And, and it, the message or the, the impression was gleaned by many Irish people and, and by the, certainly by Irish leaders that Ireland essentially was a failed entity, that it was incapable of self-propulsion, of self-sufficiency. Uh, 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 and so in the 60s to 70s, this new policy was devolved, uh, evolved, which was uh, foreign direct investment, which was essentially that instead of actually trying to imagine a way that we might live by our own lights, we chose to give our, 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 our to make ourselves dependent on transnational corporations, starting with the chemical industry, which has been, you know, we, Ireland is one of the, the biggest producers of drugs in the world. Uh, even though no Irish person really knows anything about drugs in that sense, like it's not a, it's an, it's a cuckoo in the nest industry uh, that comes to Ireland. The avail of our very low tax rates, and they then dictate to the government how things uh, should be done. And in fact, I, I've written before, and uh, many years ago, I was writing about the fact that part of the policy of government at that time was essentially to sell off to these chemical industries the right to pollute the landscape of Ireland. Uh, um, in fact, absorption capacity, these concepts were actually actively flogged, sold to outside interests. Uh, this, the pristine landscape of, of Ireland was offered to them, so it was more or less of a term that, well, you can come to Ireland, you can pollute your heart content, and nobody will notice for a very long time. So be our guest. And, and that ethic, or it is. <laughs> if you can call it an ethic, anti-ethic, I suppose you would have to say, has now gone into everything. And in fact, our entire uh, economy now, so-called, the Irish economy, not an Irish economy at all, of course, uh, is riven with this kind of thinking and, and activity, where we are, in effect, uh, but the, 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 the most appalling aspect of that is that in recent years, the big tech companies, Apple, Google, Facebook, all of these, uh, now have their European headquarters in Dublin. And they're, in effect, the government of Ireland because they come here, they pay no tax, but they acquire huge power uh, to influence our governments, to dictate the conditions of our democracy and our society. Uh, and to uh, uh, then, you know, in addition to that, to censor people in Ireland, to monopolize increasingly the channels of communication and then to censor them. So all of these forces are converging in a very, very sinister way. And the big problem, in it, that's one problem. But now, at an equal level, to answer your question fully, I would say that at least a big, as big a problem as that is the acquiescence of the general public in this whole situation. Because yeah. it seems yeah. to me that, in that, that what we're dealing with here now is that people are prepared to trade off. Indeed, just as the government trades off the capacities of the of the society, the, 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 the resources of the society, of our country, the people are prepared to trade their own resources right. for fancies and baubles uh, in the form of technological benefits. Uh, they will give their freedoms, they will give their privacy, they will give their, uh, you know, the right to travel, the right to move around their country is now forfeit. And, and uh, they don't even raise an eyelid. In fact, in, no, I beg your pardon, they do raise an eyelid. They raise an eyelid against somebody like me who has the effrontery to question it. And they say, what, don't you want to save lives? Because they are completely hypnotized with propaganda and they cannot think for themselves, I'm very sorry to say. Uh, and they just don't understand even the most basic words. I mean, I met a man in the street the other day and he asked me, oh, he was quite, uh, you know, belligerent and he, he wanted to know, he demanded to know what the hell I was doing and, and, and taking this action. Why are you taking, what are you taking this action for? And I said, freedom. And he said, I don't understand freedom. What do you mean? It's a big word. I says, it is a big word, but uh, you wouldn't be able to speak to me right now if we didn't have mm -hmm. uh, some comprehension of it. And he was st stammering and he said, are you talking about some kind of, you know, cost benefit analysis? <laughs> I said, no, I'm not. I'm talking about freedom. Uh, you see, so this is the problem. If we don't understand these things that, you know, the natural right to, to just be let alone by the government, to put it that starkly, 
yeah. if we don't understand that, then then we're in the deepest, deepest trouble because as sure as hell, if we start to think that we don't need these freedoms or that they're somehow automatic or axiomatic or naturalistic or spontaneous, then that's the moment they start to drain away. John, uh, we're facing similar situations in the United States uh, from, from, from my, my view, my perspective. Speak a little bit about uh, Gemma Aderity, Oder- uh, if I pronounced her name correctly, what she's that's doing. Funny. Yeah. Gemma Oderity, yeah. 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 my friend, and, uh, my friend and, and, and fellow traveler in this endeavor. Um, Gemma is a, a, a journalist. Uh, she, like my, I suppose in a certain sense, like myself, she's a former journalist in that we both have uh, left the media in Ireland, which had become increasingly corrupt in, in recent years. And I left in 19, 25 years ago. Uh, and I don't write for newspapers in Ireland anymore. I don't appear on Irish media. I used to be on media all the time, radio and television. It's so corrupt now that I couldn't really have uh, confidence. And it's hard to really convince myself that I'm right about this, even though I objectively speaking and abstractly speaking and intellectually speaking know that I am. But I find it in my gut, find it really incomprehensible that the media, that the whole, the whole uh, vocation of journalism should have degenerated as much as it has in the past uh, few years. And Gemma, the same. Gemma was a fantastic journalist, like the best journalist, uh, you know, of investigative journalist, the bravest, the most, uh, you know, clear-headed, the most uh, passionate, the most ethical that you could possibly meet. And she is now demonized by her former colleague, so-called, and, and, and treated as some kind of pariah and, and uh, you know, uh, uh, caricatured in all kinds of grotesque ways. I mean, it's quite bizarre, you know, the, the kinds of questions that are thrown at us by the media down at the court. We don't answer them anymore. Uh, but, you know, their attitude is extraordinary. You know, they're saying to me, so you think it's a, it's a conspiracy theory or something, you know, it's just a nonsense, the, the, the virus. You know, like these people whose job it is to investigate everything have surrendered all of their talents and all of their vocational capacities to supporting the government in whatever it seeks to do to the people. And... Uh, has refused to exercise those prerogatives of investigation, curiosity, inquiry, you know, of, uh, you know, uh, uh, disbelieving everything until it is demonstrated and so on. These characteristics of which define journalism. And uh, they have been surrendered without a struggle, without even, without a shot being fired. Yeah. Uh, John, uh, how do how do how do Irish people how, how do they move forward? How how are you moving forward in this fight? Um, have you found any successes in your argument against the High Court? If the High Court does not accept your side, what's the next angle that you approach your fight from? Well, we, we actually, just this, this afternoon, we, we finished up our case in the High Court. Uh, which, well, it's not a case. This is actually simply a, a leave case. We're applying for a judicial leave to seek judicial review of the legislation in question about the lockdown. And this also have been an automatic uh, ex parte matter where we submit an application, the judge reads through it and then says yes or no. And we go ahead into the into the judicial review process. Instead, he the judge chose to, on the very first day, to order that the the state be uh, put on notice and uh, enabled to make it at stage, which is not not rule, not not irregular in any sense, but quite unusual in this kind of case. John. Uh We've got to wind wind uh, the, the the discussion down. Um, I, look, I, if there's if there's in the United States, we're, we're dealing with uh, we're we're dealing with something that's that's similar to you. We've got uh, uh, this mandatory lockdown. Some some of the states 
uh, Florida uh, or Georgia rather, um, uh, they're easing and 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 unfolding some of these various phases to try to get um, the economy back going and people back to regular life. Uh, it's hard to see to 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 see any type of regu regularity being uh, being unfolded again in uh, the way that life is known to be lived. Uh, but now the the Trump administration's gone to an extreme, and and they're starting to now not even address uh, this this pandemic. Um, folding back some of the layers, one of the arguments stateside is again channeling economically. Okay, a why does a guy like Bill Gates, who's a computer uh, engineer, why is he now inserting himself into a health crisis, or rather health question? So that feeds back to, well, likely for money, right? Likely for economics. Um, so peeling back some of the layers in the United States, then one compares the U.S. Constitution of 1776, Article 1, Section 8, that is putting into question the economic uh, uh, organization of the Federal Reserve. Again, this is in the United States and saying, hey, is that really constitutional? Uh, if it's unconstitutional, then perhaps some of these corporations that are causing this corruption and causing this facade and confusion with people, that could be a possible root of the problem. If, if that is a narrative that could even be accurate to help explain why a guy, like you've said, Jeff Bezos, is concentrating so much on artificial de the development of artificial in uh, uh, intelligence uh, and, and, and Bill Gates, and of course, uh, former company Microsoft, uh, investing in cryptocurrency, uh, which, which really, in my view, is, is this basic kind of economy based off of uh, a digital uh, uh, air. I mean, there's, there's no real substance uh, that we know earthly that would support cryptocurrency, at least not that, that I understand or know. Um, so therefore, you've got this Federal Reserve System, which again, what is it relying on fundamentally to support itself if it's not part of the U.S. Constitution and representing the people? Is there anything like that that might be happening to be controlling the rays of the reins of the uh, judicial system in Dublin? I'm afraid not, Gina. Uh, uh, no, no, we're a long way from anything like that. In fact, we, we have been greatly encouraged by, by some of the life we see beginning to rise up in America against this lockdown and, and to, to see through it and to see that this is actually almost entirely fraudulent in terms of the, the fixing of figures and the fixing of, you know, uh, the entire uh, narrative uh, through propaganda and essentially, you know, lies, really. Uh, that this is a grossly exaggerated situation uh, as increasingly emerges in Italy and, and other places where now we had a, a leading politician in Italy in the last 24 hours, you know, uh, attacking the, his colleagues in the parliament and saying the entire thing virtually was fraudulent. Uh, like, so in Ireland, we're a very long way from that. People are so completely duped by the uh, propaganda, the, the state broadcaster is essentially, you know, it's uh, the Pravda of our country now. Uh, it's very hard to combat that. And we're, that's what we're doing, Gemma and I and others. Uh, we're trying to basically engage in not just in a, in a process of legal uh, uh, litigation, uh, uh, but also a process of education of the people using these processes, using litigation, using the case. Because in fact, our greatest hope from this case is not necessarily winning the legal argument, but actually alerting people to the fact that something big is going on uh, and that they need to start to pay attention to it. John, incredibly well said. Uh, if you would take a moment, please, and leave listeners with some closing thoughts. Well, uh, I think that uh, we really all have to, in America and Ireland, uh, start to think together insofar as we're beginning to awaken to what's happening because our world is essentially being taken away from us. And by that, I don't mean us, me, you, Ian, just, I mean, our children, our children's children. Unless we awaken now to what is happening, the, the world in which our children's children will be born into or their, their children will be so horrific compared to the world we lived in and were given by our parents and grandparents, that it will be uh, unthinkable uh, to us now. 
we won't be able to imagine the conditions that we will inflict on posterity unless we take a hand now to reclaim the instruments of democracy, of government, of public freedom, of public conversation, uh, all of these instruments which are so vital to the free, the freedoms that we take for granted. That's the terrible thing now about the modern world, that this technological revolution that we've experienced in the past two decades has given the impression that we are wholly free in some new mystical way, yeah. when in fact it, we are being, our freedoms in all the old ways are being eroded and their erosion is not being noticed because they have been taken for granted. And so what if we have to stay in our houses, that type of attitude, sure, it won't kill us. You know, well, yes, maybe you can do that for a few days and maybe you can do it yourself if you want to. But if you're being told by the police that you can't come out of your house, is that not an entirely different matter? People don't seem to see this distinction. I have no problem with people locking down in the sense of, you know, social right. distance and all that, if it's voluntary. Right. And why shouldn't our governments have the capacity as democratically elected uh, uh, bodies to ask us politely, would we please do certain things? And maybe we might agree in the interest of public health or the common good or whatever it might be on whatever occasion. But to say we should use state force, state coercion, state duress, to force you to do things without asking you politely and punish you in the most extreme way through imprisonment, through heavy fines, if you refuse. In some cases in Ireland, I mean, I saw pictures extraordinary from India where police officers were beating motorists on the roadside with canes because they refused to comply with their demands. And it, this is unbelievable to us. And it's even particularly worrying to us because our prime minister is actually uh, one generation removed from India. And we wonder if this will be next, uh, if we let him continue in his now three months sojourn, unelected in office as a caretaker administration, uh, having been booted out of office, not once, but twice in the past five years. Ladies and gentlemen, John Waters fighting for your inalienable rights wherever you are around the globe, but certainly in, in Ireland, Dublin. Uh, John, thanks for joining the program. Looking Thank forward you. to inviting you back on. Thank you. I very much enjoyed it. Thank you very much. I'd love to come again. Thank you. John Waters. Folks, uh, uh, look, um, John said some beautiful things there some great some great things um how do you feel about that and coincidentally enough coincidentally enough here um do you feel so again there's the issue of how much fear has look go to stop media stop mass and there you will find a swiss graph that shows in the United States how mass media, your major media outlets, have become monopolized. So, for instance, over the past 40 years, you take about 80 major companies controlling your media. To now, as of about what, six, seven years ago, six. That is a monopoly. Those are monopolistic characteristics being allowed to define how you receive your information, your news in the United States. You should have a problem with that. And it's not just a U.S. issue. John left Irish journalism because of the corruption. So let's draw some common threads here. John occupies, or excuse me, John lives on, in a country on, on, on an island, a country that's part of an island. Unfortunately, there are two different uh, geographical governments on that island, but he lives on an island that is simply a few miles away from the origin, basically, of the language that the two of us just just conversed in. That would be England, English, England. 
The United States Constitution, as I open the show, is written in English from England. If a guy like Bill Gates is so grossly wealthy compared to the average person, and he made his money from computer engineering, why is he inserting himself into the health conversation? Well, of course, for money. You think he cares really about the longevity of the human race? Think so? I think he cares about himself, in my opinion, himself and his family and his kids and, and his future generations, would be my guess. Okay, The man inserted himself as a career at Harvard studies to develop computer software. It's not like he joined the Peace Corps out of high school because he wanted to fight for human rights. It's not like he became a doctor or researcher, scientist, to study to try to find a vaccine for cancer or a cure for one of the diseases. He didn't do that as a teenager, folks. If he really, in my opinion, had the human race at his best interest, he may have joined a. He may have joined a, a chosen a different career path. Perhaps, maybe, maybe not. Who am I to say? I'm not speaking to him, and I don't know him. And I'm speaking for myself, in my opinion of him. But I am saying, as a human being, a fellow human being, do you agree with a mandatory lockdown? I mean, if you're prone to catching the COVID nineteen virus. Shouldn't that be your choice to associate with somebody else without gloves and mask? Okay, well, you could be caring. Well, then, if you're afraid of catching it, then maybe you want to voluntarily self-quarantine. That, that, that would be my... I, I would tend to side with that view and that angle. I would, I would tend to side with that. And I would tend to side with John's argument that no government should mandate when and where you can go in any public street or publicly accessible store because of a health threat. You can walk down the street and get hit by a car and die that way. I'm not looking, not looking at statistics. What, what, what are the statistics? I can tell you right now that on worldometers.org, I can guarantee that there are more people that have died from starvation today than have died because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Yes, people have died from both. But if an individual is mega wealthy and concerned about the longevity of the human race, perhaps... Buy people some food might be a better option than trying to mandatorily vaccinate and microchip and digitally certify people. Just a thought. This has been Ian Trottier for another Discussion of Truth. I will be back in about two minutes, actually, to bring on Dear Maid McCullough.